Perfect, thank you very much. And I'm gonna grab some water because maybe you can hear it, but I'm a little bit cold. So how were the previous uh, talks? Were they good? Okay, high pressure. Um, yeah, so thanks uh, for having me. Beautiful uh, room we're sitting in. Uh, actually, my first time being here in Enschede. I'm com I was born in Eindhoven and I live now in Amsterdam. And today we're going to talk about life after death. Um, not per se a, a topic most people are super excited about, death. But hopefully after this talk, after this presentation, you have a little bit of more lightness concerning uh, death. Should I point somewhere? Is there a pointing direction or? Help. Okay. Maybe you can check it out. No, I also have my own uh, clicker, if that, or maybe it's the wrong clicker. Oh, probably it's this clicker. Yeah. Yep, <laughs> we got the right clicker. That's also very handy. Um, so I said, uh, I'm Bob Hendricks. I grow to life as sort of a architect, inventor, designer. I graduated from the Technical University of Delft uh, on architecture. Uh, probably I'm the only architect who ever designed a coffin, but we'll get into that later. And um, I'm also a research affiliate at the MIT Media Lab, in which we do a lot of brainstorming about, hey, what happens after sustainability and what is beyond, um, beyond that and how can we as a species become carbon positive. Uh, it's a lot of fun, a lot of smart people. Sometimes I like to think like, hey, I know some stuff and then I come there and I'm the, the sort of the idiot in the class, not to say that I'm an idiot, but they're pretty smart. Um, so that's very interesting. We'll also go into some of those topics uh, during this talk. So you'll see how they are really turning science fiction into reality. Uh, but let's start by the beginning. Um, so I'm the youngest of four boys. My mom really wanted a girl. She kept on pushing, but only boys. And as you can imagine, yeah, being the youngest, yeah, you're not always being taken seriously. You're spoiled, but my opinion did not always matter. Like, I had the last pick on where we could go on holiday. And at some point, I realized, like, hey, I'm not being taken so seriously. And I found a friend. That friend was called Nature. And I learned, like, hey, Nature's also not being taken seriously. So I felt a lot of empathy. And yeah, I, I don't know. I, it, something happened there. And we've been dating ever since. <laughs> um, and of course, you guys all know it. Hey, we're, we're doing some things that are yeah, not per se in the right way, and shouldn't we be doing something else with nature? Can we collaborate? Can we learn from them? And um, I was going to uh, Technical University of Delft to study there and really wanting to do something with nature. And being an architect, the best thing you could do was like build self-sufficient homes. That was the top-notch thing. If you were doing that, you get at least a nine on your project. But we wanted to take a little step further. So together with two friends doing our bachelors, we went to Detroit, the city that went bankrupt in which 60% of the population left. And we bought a broken down house for 1,000 euros. Uh, for the Dutchies, uh, we bought a house for one month worth of stuffy. It was a very exciting, uh, uh, how do you say it? Reporter that wanted this quote. But it was a really interesting project. I went there for one and a half years. We sort of revitalized it, we created a non-profit, raised a lot of funds, rebuilt the home, and it should be an example of how other people can also make their homes more self-sufficient. It was very idealistic, there was a lot of positive energy, uh, but when I came back, I was a little bit depressed because we got so much media attention, everybody's like, yes, this is the future, this is it. And I was like, but if this is the future, we don't have resources to do that on everything, and the only thing we're focusing on is minimizing the negative impact. We're not doing anything good, we're just only being less bad. So for me, it felt like, okay, this, it's a step in the right direction, but I don't know, I'm not really feeling it. And I was thinking about, should I continue my master program or do something on my own, but I really didn't have an idea, so I thought, okay, let's do something fundamental. 
let's say we have to be a carbon positive species and we can only collaborate with the organism if they are alive. That's the rule. If we kill it, we're gone. So we have to collaborate them with their life. Um, so this was sort of my inspiration. You probably have seen this picture. One of the most intelligent organisms of our planet. Uh, perhaps you've seen my octopus teacher. It's super interesting, scary and fascinating at the same time. Um, but you can buy them for 36 pence in a supermarket. Um, so this really is a good problem statement. We do not value nature um, when it's alive. We value it when it's dead. And we value it very poorly, unfortunately. So I said, OK, let's change that. Let's only collaborate with living materials and no longer work with dead materials. So that was sort of my starting point. And this is where it gets tricky, because at some point you've seen this image, you think, indeed, why are we killing every organism and sort of degrade it into one stupid material property? So probably most of the things around us here are death. We're sort of living in nature's graveyard. And what we do as an intelligent species, we go into the wood, we see super smart organisms, and we say, hey, I know something great. If we can kill it, we can have one of their thousands of thousands of material properties, and let's make a bench out of it. That's what we're doing on a large scale. And what I believe is what we should be doing is look at the organism and see, hey, you are so special. You have so many material properties. We have certain needs, and how can we collaborate with them? And here we're going a little bit into science fiction, because we don't know yet how that will look. And that was the same reaction my professors gave me when I said, like, guys, we should be growing homes. We go to the Home Depot or to the Gamma, and we look at the seeds, and it's like apartment building, studio building, villa, and we plant them, and we grow a home from that. Or we can light up our complete cities with bioluminescent algae, in which we don't have active energy, we just have a chemical reaction, biological reaction, of the organism. And of course, we're having living bins, which means we have trash cans. Like, what are we doing now with our trash? We just put it somewhere in a plastic bag that travels a lot of miles, and then we burn it in a certain location. That, in my opinion, that's pretty stupid. It's an, most of the time, it's organic matter. There are lots of organisms that can eat it, so why not have a living bin that does that for you? And this vision sort of... Yeah, at some point, my professor's like, Bob, chill out. This is, I understand your vision, but it's not realistic. This is a dream vision. We're a technical university. You can't graduate on this. And I said, OK, but what is my other option? This is the problem. If I do this, I for 100% certain know I will be less bad. If we, grow, if we build with wood, it's better than the conventional, but in the end, we're still killing the organism. So fundamentally, we're doing the exact same, only less bad. And they said, OK, OK, I get what you're saying. Um, yeah, maybe you can then try it. And I was like, yes, OK, we're going to do this. So I did a lot of material research. I sort of went from an architect, released my inner David Edinburgh, and just went into nature looking at, OK, what is there? What is growing? How can we build with something that nature is creating? And of course, there's the corals. They grow slow. There's the bees. How can you make them grow something? There were a lot of organisms that had a lot of potential. But in the end, humans want to be fast. They want to be cheap. And um, they have also certain sort of wishes. So within that framework, I said, OK, I know one organism. It's called mycelium. This has a lot of potential because it grows crazy fast. It's living everywhere in the world. And it has a lot of good benefits in nature. So for people who do not yet know this, mycelium is the root structure of mushrooms. I'm sure you probably know this, because otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, but mushrooms are yeah, the vegetative part of fungi. It's sort of the flower. And the actual organism is the white stuff beneath it. Which is weird, because most people think that the mushroom itself is sort of the plant, the animal sort of kind of thingy. It's actually its own kingdom. So fungi are a separate kingdom. They're different. Um, and they're actually also the biggest organism. So for in one big forest in, I think it's Oregon, at least it's in the United States, there is one organism that has the whole forest floor covered of this surface area, which means if you go into the ground, you see the mycelium, you, put, you, you take out its DNA. It's the exact same DNA if you go four kilometers on the other side. It's the same organism. Super interesting. 
So I said, okay, this could be cool. We can grow materials with it. And if we can grow materials with it, we can transform the architecture industry, right? Because we're no longer building, we're growing. So I did a lot of research um, at the university. This is sort of how, how it goes. You have a mold, you fill it up with substrate. It's the stuff that the mycelium eats. It can be anything, it can be textile, it can be wood chips, it can be hemp, you name it. They even ate plastic. And together you inoculate it with a certain preference of mycelium. So you can say, hey, you can answer today, we have a certain type that gives certain material properties, maybe a little bit more rubber-like material. And we go to San Francisco, there's a little bit more stony mushroom, so it becomes a little bit of a harder brick. Um, it brings a whole new variety of material properties. And when you put that in the oven, it becomes extra hard and extra light, and it sort of becomes a bio-based styrofoam. And I was doing my research and I thought by myself, wow, this is pretty good, this is going in the right direction. I mean, it's super practical. Um, this is how we do it, right? Um, so I was in the lab and my fellow students were there as well and I said, told them like, hey, I think I'm ready to graduate. And everyone was like, yeah, I think so too. Um, okay, well, I'll see you guys uh, later then. Hang up my coat. And I walked back. But then something happened, because the next day I came back and I saw this, and I go, Hä? what happened? I put them in the oven, and I thought, oh my God, I put them in the oven. This is exactly what's happening. I was again being the parasite. I was putting them in the oven, I was again killing them. I was so good on my right track. I wanted to do an equal relationship, but at the end, it was like, hey, I'm Bob. I want to be the future architect. I'm going to grow and build homes. And in sort of that ego mindset, I went all the way and started in the end killing the organism. And this sample, I forgot, I still have it. They grow together, sort of, hey, sort of saying, almost, yeah, philosophical, we're, we're staying together and it's actually sprouting a mushroom, you can see it on the trap, which means, hey, we're ready to survive. And I thought by myself, whoa, okay, so we have to go back again, what, what is happening here? And um, I think this sort of summarizes it up. We have a very big rooted ego mindset, which means we are dominant to nature. And I had the right intention, but still subconsciously, I wanted to dominate the organism. That's what happened. And luckily we saw it, we were aware of it. Okay, this is not the right thing to do, at least from my perspective. I wanted to do it differently. So again, we're going into the more natural ecological environment that says, hey, the natural world is collaborating together. And I think one of the big um, moments for me that really changed it was watching Serengeti Rules, which is a documentary um, about how nature sort of works together. And for me, I was always like, yeah, whenever there was in the news, like there's this little bee or this little mice, it, it, when it dies, there's a huge problem. Like, I always felt like the empathy, but people around me were like, yeah, but who cares, it only that one mice, why is that important? And I always felt like this is important, but I couldn't really grasp, like, why? But after watching this uh, video, it's it actually, there's also a new one now on Vancouver Island, it's called Sea Wolves on Netflix. It's also about the cycle of life. It's really uh, interesting. But long story long, what happens in this uh, documentary it shows the cycle of life of, of how other populations work together with the ecosystem. What happens, just to give you one summary, is the other population is decreasing. They don't know why. It's a beautiful harbor village. They go into the waters. They don't see the others. They don't see the, se the seals. And uh, they do see a lot of orcas. And they're like, hey, what are the orcas doing here? They're supposed to be out there at this time of the year. So what's happening? What happened, humans were actively fishing whales back in Japan. That was the food source for orcas. Their name actually is also killer whale. They like to eat whales, but their food source was gone. So what did they do? They came into the towns of Vancouver, ate a lot of beavers and a lot of seals. And then you can say, okay, that's life. That's the natural cycle. Of course, but the main problem here was is that the beavers are a keystone species. So within every network of organisms, for example, the forest, the desert, or something else, there are certain species that when they die or when they disappear, the ecosystem collapse. So you can wonder, okay, what is it that these others do? They like to eat sea urchins. 
They live in the forest, oh, sorry, in the, below the kelp forest. So you see an otter there on its back, eating like a little uh, sea urchin. And the sea urchins, what they do is they eat the kelp forest. So you can imagine if there's no sea otter, the sea urchin is like, yes, we have free space. We're going to eat the kelp forest. But the kelp forest brings in the oxygen in the water. So if there's no more oxygen in the water, the whole system turns around. There's no oxygen, the ecosystem collapses. This is the end of my presentation, thank you. No. Um, so what happens is that's a bad thing. But the good thing that they show in the documentary as well, if you bring back the keystone species in certain environments, then you can also turn it around. So it's actually a really hopeful uh, story. Um, and this brings me also to one of the projects at the MIT Media Lab, which when I first heard about it, I thought, <laughs> great joke. Uh, but this is real. So what's happening? They are bringing back the woolly mammoth species, which is an extinct, extinct species. This is real. This is happening right now at the MIT Media Lab. Please look it up. The project is called Revive and Restore. So what did they do? They added the genome of an Asian elephant. They turned it sort of into a woolly mammoth. They implemented it in the Asian elephant, and the Asian elephant will give birth to the woolly mammoth. This is Jurassic Park. This is real. Then you can say like, hey, but okay, then we have the woolly mammoth. Like, who cares? I mean, it's fun, but who cares? This is actually from the same guys that were also involved in the documentary. They've seen the northern hemisphere, the northern Arctic, really collapsing because of the absence of the woolly mammoth. I don't know exactly the details, but it has something to do with trees and that they bump into the trees so they fall over, so there's a lot of life for microorganisms. But you have to look up the details. But at least what they want to do is bring it back, release it there in sort of a certain program, and revive that area. And this is where it also comes to an ethical side, because we're creating creatures. Um, that's a different topic. I'll leave that to you. But just to give you an idea of what's happening and what's possible, and um, they've raised, I think they've raised 60 million uh, so far to make this happen, and they're expecting the first baby in three years. Um, so we're going to experience this. Uh, but again, I was in the mindset of, OK, what is the ego thing? What is, the, what is sort of right? almost a biblical question, when am I right, when am I wrong? I was thinking about this a lot, and I wanted to do a little bit of more deep diving into the organism, because I was only looking at mycelium at the first time for my benefits. I wanted to use it. And then I thought, okay, but what does mycelium want? My professors went crazy. <laughs> Bob, this is not a scientific question. You cannot ask yourself, what do mushrooms want? But I said, I have to understand, because I don't know what they do. Um, so again, we went all out to David Edinburgh. We went out uh, researching mycelium, uh, having a lot of meetings with professors who study mycology, which is actually a scientific field of work, which I didn't know. It's just people that know a lot about mushrooms. It's really interesting. Um, and I learned it's actually pretty simple. Um, they recycle dead organic matter and toxins into key plant food for the whole forest floor. They are the thriving piece in the whole cycle of life as we know it. Of course, you've seen it on your um, countertop in your kitchen. You leave a sandwich there, mycelium spores from the air. They will come, they will eat it, transform it into something new. So whenever a bird, anything falls on the forest floor, mycelium is there. They call their friends, the insects, the bacteria. Hey, guys, party's over here. <laughs> Let's go. That's what they do. And that's what they do really good. And next to that uh, characteristic, they're also considered nature's internet. So maybe you've seen the TED talk, why do trees talk to each other, of the hidden life of trees. It's based, actually also the movie Avatar, you know that everything talks to each other, is based on the mycelium network. So what happens, they do not only share food with each other, but there's also an ability to communicate with, e with each other. So they're not gossiping about us, but maybe who knows. But they, certain, they can give certain electrical signals and also antidotes for certain diseases. So for example, if we're all three in a forest, I get sick and I'm making antidotes and I'm already giving it to all of you. It's sort of as a natural uh, protection. Um, and this research topic is really interesting because for a long time, most people had their eyes on like the animals and plants, everything above. And since I think one, an ew, what is it, ew, in, in a century, uh, most people are more, of scientific people are more and more focusing on life, like in the surface, because they understand, like, hey, 
whatever happens above the ground is coming from in the ground. Um, so what they do is enable new life to flourish. And for me, again, this was another insight, like, hey, wow, this is interesting. Um, never really thought about it. And um, at this moment, I was um, at the Dutch Design Week presenting my living home, uh, because, of course, my ego still wanted something, so I had to give it to him. And a person came to me like, hey, Bob, uh, super cool, your living house, how fast does it grow? I said, like, seven days, we can grow it. And um, she told me like, hey, but what happens if my grandma dies? I'm like, yeah, she will be absorbed, she will release nutrients, and new life will flourish from her ashes. And I was way too excited, and I know it's like, oh, shit, sorry. <laughs> um, but at that moment, I thought like, oh my god, this is what mycelium wants. They want to simply recycle us and give us sort of new life. And then I had the idea, okay, a mycelium coffin. But I was just graduated, I didn't have money. And you, like, if your normal friends are going to like consultancies and like what normal TU Delft people do, then going for a coffin was pretty uh, scary. Um, so luckily, I found, wrapped myself together and said, okay, we're gonna try this for half a year, we're gonna grow some stuff and just go to some funeral homes and see yeah, what will happen, right? I learned a lot. The funeral industry, it's gross and it's exciting at the same time. Um, I mean, everyone dies, so there's a lot of connection in there. Um, the business aspect is really weird. Some people are super honest, but other people are like, hey, yeah, it's an event and they make, they see it as a really commercial opportunity. Uh, what, what, what I learned the most is we see ourselves as waste we're treated exactly the same, that when we die, we get burnt. And this is, is exactly the key point again, like, hey, we have this organism, there's a lot of value, and what do we smart humans do with it? We burn it. We're literally breaking up the cycle of life, all the nutrients that are in our body, we're not giving them back, we're giving them, we're throwing them in the bin. So for me, this was like, okay, yeah, this is weird, but all the people were like, yeah, but we have a cremation, and we're doing this, so, it was a really weird moment because I wanted to go and do business with them, but at the same time I was like, but hey, yeah, this is sort of weird. Um, anyhow, I also learned that most people actually are walking uh, bins in this uh, lifetime, so we pollute a lot of our environment, we grow crops on them, we grow fish on them in those environments, in the end, we eat, we eat them. So we become our environment. That's just how life works, and if we pollute the environment, pollution comes into us, and that's what's happening. We're only seeing the surface of that, and actually Dutch researchers have shown already like, hey, we're having microplastics in our uh, blood next to all the medicines and metals and etc. And of course, this can go back in nature, and you can say like, hey, one person, not really bad, but everyone dies. And our soil quality is in yeah, not super good condition, as you might have seen in the news, and it's one of our valuable resources, because if we don't have healthy soil, yeah, then we can't, can't have healthy forests. And that brings us to the forest, because this is nature's graveyard. Nothing happens there. The best thing that we can do is just live, die, lay down, and become part of the cycle again. That's how nature works. But that will be highly illegal if we do that in almost every country in the world. Because there is no business model if you do that, right? So, yeah, why would, would, would you do that? And of course, there's also the thing with diseases, which actually went from like the Middle Ages, so people, like a dead body, if you would touch it, you will also die. And that, that not really has been researched for a long period of time, so there's a lot of um, opportunity in there. But we said, hey, we want to collaborate with the living organism, bring this keystone species back into the ground where it belongs, revitalize the soil, oh yeah, and at the same time, it's actually also a coffin. But that's not the main thing, we wanted to restore nature. So we said, this is what we do. We grow our organisms in only seven days in a factory in Delft, near the TU Delft campus. The cool thing actually is that during growth, uh, mycelium absorbs CO2, so there's a lot of CO2 in the organism. When it's released into the soil, it actually releases that, so there's a lot of carbon into the soil, which is very good for plant growth. It's biodegradable, so in 45 days it's sort of one with the natural world. And here it will actually recover um, some of the soil. So what mycelium can also really uh, do is revitalize soil. So they bring in a lot of car carbon, 
a lot of energy. They're really sort of if you are buried in a yeah, bag of pokon, you, when you get flowers, there's a lot of the nutrients with it. That's sort of what you're doing to the soil, and thereby increasing the biodiversity again, so changing uh, how we see that. Um, we got a lot of media attention. Um, so, so far, this is almost like two and a half years ago since we first uh, started it. So far, more than 500 people have chosen to be uh, either buried, buried, natural buried, or even cremated uh, with it. Um, and it's been a quite a journey. And I just thought maybe nice to show you some pictures of hey, how does something happen? When I first entered into this whole vision, I never had any intention of building a coffin. It all started with a house. Then this was the first coffin. We went to Dela. We did some prototypes. Um, this was at Yes Delft, the incubator, where we have like a little startup incubator from the TU Delft. A lot of whiskets, a lot of robots, and one guy with a coffin. And we got some uh, news activities uh, because we had the first funeral held that was just like, hey, we made a flyer, hey, funeral home, can you maybe ask people if they want it? And literally on the first day, I was like, hey, Bob, yeah, we got one. I was like, oh, okay, we only have prototypes because that's how you do a startup. You prototype and do things. And we didn't expect it to happen. So somebody went into a coffin. At the moment, we were super proud of it, but we now look at the pictures like, oh my God, we gave that coffin. Uh, but luckily, it really helped us to scale up and um, make sure we can enrich more worlds of more nature worldwide. Um, this is our current product. On the 22nd of May, which is only, I think, 11 or 12 days, we're um, releasing a new uh, complete product portfolio with products that are actually nice looking. So not only good for the earth, but also nice for the eye, which is very uh, helpful, I think. And also with a better price point. So for example, now, our product is around 1,500, and then we're dropping it to 1,000, so we're more into conventional coffins, which is super important because then it becomes normal. Uh, now it's like, oh, that's crazy mushroom coffin, that's super expensive and looks like a fridge box. Uh, we don't want that. And then it, w then it will be a different story, hopefully. Uh, we raised one million uh, with Dragon's Den. Maybe you heard of it. Um, we actually never thought like, hey, we're gonna actually raise money. It was more like for marketing, but then, yeah. <laughs> Why not? Um, so that was really nice. So we're working really well with Sean Harris. Um, she's sort of a sustainable impact investor, and she helps us a lot, like, hey, how to scale up. We're building a factory now in the Netherlands. OK, but if we want to ship to the UK, we should have a factory there. How do we do that? Uh, a lot of things. That's why I have the gray hairs when I'm still 29. Um, <coughs> and uh, this is our factory. There, I thought this was also fun to show you guys. There's a Tesla funeral car. I mean, <laughs> Tesla is everywhere, right? Um, which is uh, fun, but also actually really good because the biggest polluter for most of the times when the f there is a funeral is actually the traffic. Because, for example, if you have like 300 people at your funeral and it's like a four hour drive, that's like a huge distance. Um, so that's also really nice. Uh, but you can also imagine, like, as a, because it's a Dutch innovation days, hey. Uh, because it's a Dutch innovation days from like, hey, you started as a bio designer with all these crazy ideas and now, and now I feel like a manager. And it's not per se something I, yeah, I like it, but I want it to be the kid that plays again and just finds all this crazy stuff. Um, so I had to go back to the North Sea again for the Dutch Design Week, which I built in a little bit of space, like, hey, I'm on holiday, I'm gonna do some things on my own. Uh, which was really nice. I uh, used to go there as a kid to the North Sea, and in my memory, it was always like a super boring sea that was gray and just like long, and didn't really have that warm memories with it. We always went looking for shark teeth at the beach. And at some point, I re really noticed like, hey, there are some soft corals living in the North Sea. I had like a so soft so coral aquarium, really into corals. Looked it up, hey, we have corals in the Netherlands. Like, what corals in the Netherlands? How can that be? Um, so this is a project in which I sort of went deep diving into sea anemones and how we can collaborate with sea anemones. They are true wizards of the sea, almost like the mushrooms of the sea, also eating a lot of stuff. So we said, hey, let's make a little bit of a more conceptual design living bins. So I brought a little video with you. I hope the sound uh, will work. We'll find out right now. With over 1,000 colorful species across the ocean floor, 
Sea anemones play a vital role as recyclers in marine ecosystems. Even in our grey North Sea, the beautiful beadlet anemone can be found. With its long arms, it reaches for new nutrients. While sea anemones attract waste from the ecosystem into their inflatable bodies, humans tend to transport their weight around the globe. Research has shown that in some cities, the annual collection and distribution of our weight is equal to six times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Why do we drive trash around the city? In nature, sea anemones feed on animal and plant waste. Bacteria can eat plastic, and mycelia has shown to neutralize heavy toxins. If we could learn to collaborate with these intelligent creatures of our planet, it would allow us to process waste locally while restoring native ecology. Imagine ecosystems specially designed for regional waste challenges, living bins that eat our trash. Be wondered by the generosity of the natural world and never take out trash. Yeah, so you can see this is a little bit more of a speculative design. So in my opinion, the direction is really good, but yeah, how can we implement it practically? I'm curious, like, can you already imagine you have a little living bin and you just throw the banana peel in there? Uh, because for me, it, well, it was always like, yeah, banana peel, and then I do it like this, it goes into plastic, and I was thinking, like, okay, this is now in plastic, going to dry four hours, and then it's being burned somewhere. Like, for me, it's like, what are we doing? But again, we have to focus, first things first. This is another cool uh, project. Uh, this is also the last project I'll show. This is uh, together with a startup called Respire, which you maybe have heard of. Uh, they grow uh, bioreceptive concrete, and together with them, we did a project. We said, like, hey, um, yeah, one of like, the city elements, city furniture, for example, like a roadblock, that's just one, super ugly, two, uh, super impractical, and it doesn't inhabit local species. So looking at the species of mosses, what are they good at, what do they do? They give a lot of oxygen, CO2, a lot of traffic pollution, but actually they're the birth ground for lots of insects. So most insects lay their eggs in moss. So if there's no moss in the city, the insects, where do they lay their eggs? And of course there are alternatives, but I hope now you've seen like, hey, with this different mindset, there's a lot of benefit that we can implement in our cities. Um, so we built like, hey, the living roadblock at the Dutch Design Week, uh, which was really fun. Um, and if I find time again in my schedule, we'll also, I'm willing to like upskill this so that we have living roadblocks everywhere. Because the cool thing about living roadblocks is like, hey, they travel all around the city. So there's a lot of migration and of insects and a lot of good things happening. Um, so again, looking back from all of this, why are we doing this? This is simply, like, we're going to die. And we have two choices. We can leave our loved ones behind as waste, or we can choose to be compost. And I like to be compost because that gives me a good feeling and makes me feel like, hey, I added value to our planet. Um, so the key message here is, hey, we need to be thinking more like an organism, let go of the ego, and think, hey, what is it actually that this organism wants? So maybe tonight you're sitting at the dining table and like, hey, but what is it that this this wooden table won it. And you have a good and fun conversation. And I'm 100% sure that you guys can do this for the one simple reason, is that you guys are an organism too. And sometimes we tend to forget that, but we're an organism. I mean, more elephants, more tigers on the planet, it's not gonna harm everyone. So why should extra humans have such a negative footprint? So let's uh, change that. Thank you uh, for your time.